because you always remember all of you around here would, may or may not remember, but there was a, a tragic situation with the Mercedes once that had a nice flat under tray and uh, it went over the little bump down all the time and uh, the wind got under it and off it went into the trees like a, like a, a piece of paper. Uh, so we wanted to avoid that sort of, that sort of uh, problem happening. And, you know, just as a matter of interest, um, for those who, who may not be aware, who read the book, you will be, um, and that is that every curve on here uh, was calculated mathematically by Malcolm Sayer. You know, every single curve. And it was all done on the basis of aerodynamics. Malcolm was a, an absolute genius. Not only was he a genius, I have to say, and I'm sure everybody who knew Malcolm would support me in saying that he was a fabulous guy. Great guy, a real person, um, no old buck about him at all. Sorry, George, didn't intend that as a pun. But in actual fact, he really was a super guy, wasn't he? Yes. A gentleman. Um, which didn't always work sometimes in a car company. But sometimes you had to, there was a bit of elbowing and, you know, pushing and shoving to get what you wanted. Um, so, overall, um, I guess. My memories of the car are uh, very, very dear ones in that we were really going for broke. Um, Lofty pulled off a master stroke. He, um, any of, the, of you who knew Lofty England, he was a batman who could make anything happen. And um, I, I, we wanted to get to Le Mans to see why the big Fords and the Chaparral were doing so well. So he actually got me into the Aston Martin, or better not record the Aston Martin, but he got me into the, the Aston Martin team, race team, and they had two cars. And they weren't going to last long because the fuel pump packed up on those after about three laps. So I was the timekeeper on their stand. So as soon as they were out of the race, I was crawling about in the pits. And then at night, when it was all dark, and everybody was enjoying themselves, I was crawling around with the ruler and the flashlight. Doing what the Japanese do, today, you know, when they go around motor shows, <laughs> snapping it all and you know, mirroring it all. Came back here, drew it all out, and I remember this was a Ford, the first one of the big Fords, and they've got this big headline saying the first suspension designed by computer. Well, you know what? When we put that on the drawing board here at Jaguar, we couldn't make it work at all, and neither could Ford, because they didn't do any good. Uh, so it does show that, you know, it's, a, it's the input that matters and the knowledge and the know-how. And that's something that Jaguar had and, and, and has got today, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I guess that probably covers what I want to say, apart from the fact that it was tragic that uh, Norman in the end managed to get a, the use of an aerodrome uh, where we got some high speeds, but we could we weren't really wanted Felton where we could get up to 215 mile an hour. We really wanted to get up that high. We needed a bit more power from George, um, but you know the V squared problem on aerodynamics. Um, but at the same time, um, as we were moving into that phase of getting the car completed, um, and bear in mind uh, for those who read the book and look at it in detail. This is a completely monocoque structure, which everybody, you know, bear in mind, I, I moved from Jaguar when it went under the Kremlin, we called it Longbridge, sorry, run by Leyland. Um, Colin Chapman enticed me down to Lotus. And of course, Collins attributed to always design the first monocoque Formula One uh, race car. And that is true with Formula One, but on this car, we actually had a complete monocoque structure. And the engine, uh, you'll notice, is mounted, mounted on solid structures on the outside tubs with the, the fuel tanks and so on and so forth, all we want. Um, and it was a really complex job to do that. But nevertheless, the team did it. And the team was a, one of those teams, like the experimental department, ran 724. Um, which is what Jaguar is all about, and the people of Jaguar are all about. Um, so, we're all doing so well, and then, of course, as usual, and I apologise for this, if there's any French uh, people in the, in the uh, audience, and that is that, because 
other countries were winning them all. The French, the FIA, FIA decided to change the rules. You remember that? Yeah. And they, where unlimited engine size was okay, suddenly it was down to three litres. So it, it, it put us out of business fundamentally. <coughs> but nevertheless, it proved, absolutely proved, as Peter said earlier, that what Jaguar could do and could have done again. Uh, because don't forget, it's marvellous heritage with, the, I mean, for example, the D-type. For me, the D-type with a wing on the back, especially, is still one of my favourite, favourite cars. And it's a beautiful car. And again, designed by Malcolm in terms of the aerodynamics and uh, styling. Um, so that really is all I can say about it, apart from the fact that it was a, it was a tiny team that worked on it. We had to be secretive. It's a wonder there are so many photographs. I've only just had a look at the book this morning, but I think Peter's done a fabulous job in finding so many pictures and pieces of data, memos that I can't even remember writing, actually. <laughs> and probably I have to deny later on in court or something. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, they weren't what we really meant, because what we really meant, we used to talk to each other a lot, and we were like that as a team. And I think that's what... Jaguar's about. Jaguar now is, is thrusting forward and doing so well in the world and, uh, and it deserves it and long may it continue. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting me along uh, to such a auspicious occasion because this is the secret of Jaguar that had never been revealed before and uh, now you've revealed it. Congratulations.